Amen. Happy Easter. Welcome. We are glad to have you here at St. Andrews by the Sea United Methodist Church. And uh, we greet those of you that are here and as they are coming in, uh, and to those that are watching on our live stream. Uh, We are here to celebrate that Christ is risen, and we are here to celebrate that good news. We have all sorts of wonderful stuff for you, but we do this every week, right? So, yeah, every Sunday. Um, But at this time, I'm going to invite our lay leader, Jenny Fries, to come, and she's going to lead us in the call to worship. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. On this day, we celebrate the resurrection. On this day, we celebrate the resurrection. <laughs> the power of life has overcome the power of death. The way of peace has prevailed against the violence of the world. The light of love has shattered the darkness of fear. Thank you. 
start to a glorious morning. I'm Emily Breithauer, and I want to encourage you to introduce yourselves to those who are standing nearby, past the peace of Christ, and the children can come on down for time with Pastor Carl. Oh, yes. Well, good luck with that. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I may need that. Yeah. We'll see. You're, you're going to want to sit facing this way, looking up this way. Yeah, there you go. That's good. All right, we'll have our kids make their way down. All right. Well, good morning. You all know what the Easter story is about, right? It's about a rope, right? No, it's about Jesus. You're right, you're right. But Jesus came down from God, way up above. And what Jesus did was, he came and he shared love with everybody. Um, oh, we have more coming down. We have two Easter bunnies coming down as well. There, nice hop, well done. And seen, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so Jesus came down from God and uh, taught everybody about God's love. People over here, people over there. And in fact, he taught about God's love that has no beginning and no end. It's kind of like a circle, like this. No beginning and no... Well, let's take the end off. There we go. No beginning <laughs> and no end, like that. All right, we'll go back to Jesus. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so... Now, Jesus was teaching all these people about God's love, but some people got upset, and, uh, and they had Jesus arrested. There, that's uh, arrested. And then, and then they took him before the government, and the government got upset, and they got mad at Jesus. And you know what they did? They, uh, they killed Jesus. It was very, very sad. There we go. Yeah, they, they, and they didn't know what to do, and his friends were really sad. But on Friday, they had to bury Jesus very quickly. They had to put him in a tomb very quickly because on Saturday was the Sabbath. So they wrapped Jesus up as best they could. And then they put him in a tomb. And he was in there Friday and Saturday and Sunday. But do you know what happened when they came back to the tomb on Sunday? What? He wasn't there, that's right. He was absolutely not there. In fact, the only thing that was there was his grave clothes, just like that. And Jesus was alive again. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Christ is risen, and that's the good news today that you're gonna go learn in Sunday school, that we're gonna learn that Jesus is risen and that death no longer has a sting for us, but that God loves us and God has raised Jesus from the dead. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go to Sunday school. God, we thank you that you uh, love us and that on this Easter we celebrate that you are risen. Uh, be with our children as they go to Sunday school to learn more about you. We ask this all in your name. Amen. All right, and I think... You can follow that whole crew back there. Uh, Miss Karen in the lead and then everyone else. And you have now announcements. Go off to Sunday school. There is Sunday school and nursery care should you wish it, but your <laughs> children are also welcome to stay in service with us as well. And if you are very interested in it, there will be an egg hunt on the lawn at 11 or 30, but it's really for fifth graders and under, I'm sorry to say for most of us here, so. That's coming up. Well, welcome to worship this morning at St. Andrews. Um, I am thrilled to be worshiping with you, and it is good to be in this family of God this morning. I do have a few announcements for you. If you're with us for the very first time and you'd like to get to know more about what this family of faith is all about, you're welcome to scan the QR code on the front and we will be in touch in whatever way makes the most sense for you. If that's a phone call or an email, um, we will be in touch in that way. I want to say a special thank you to the folks who donated um, Easter flowers. They have adorned our sanctuary and it looks very festive in here. If you are one of those folks, you are welcome to pick up your flower of choice 
No fighting. I know they're all different, and some people have already sort of staked out their claim on particular flowers. I don't know who that would be. Anyways, no fighting over the flowers. There's plenty of love to go around. So thank you for helping make our sanctuary beautiful this morning. Um, we do have a couple of announcements of highlights of coming events. And on the back, you'll see a thing of, of your bulletin. There's a thing about Stellar. Stellar is our Vacation Bible School. It's going to happen this year in June, uh, June 26th through 30th. And that's for preschool kids through fifth grade. Registration is open, and we are actively looking for volunteers. It's a fun week, but we do need a lot of volunteers to make it happen. So we're looking forward to that. You can, do, you can register for that today for your kids who are in uh, fifth grade or below. And then we, I want to highlight for you one of the fun things that we will do as a congregation together in two weeks, and that's going to be our Rise Against Hunger event. So on the 23rd, we will gather in the other building after a light lunch. Just, this is the prop time, right? The, yeah. Did you have your props? Got it. Okay, good. So we'll gather in that building, and we are going to package up meals. Carl, I don't know if you've noticed this about Carl, but he wants to do more and more every year. So last year we did 12,000 meals. That's not going to be good enough for this year. So this year we're doing 15,000 meals. And this that he's holding up here, the prop, there we go, that's, that's right. what we're going to package up. Um, and that is a complete meal for six individuals. So we will put all the elements together. And yes, good job. And oh. then we will put them in boxes. That, that just just almost exactly I like practiced. that. I practiced. Did you? I did. You pr oh, I'm so proud. We did practice a lot for Easter. It's true. So yeah, that's I'm, true. I'm glad you got that part right. Um, in each box mm -hmm. will go 36 bags, and we will, and that means 216 meals per box. And they ship these, um, this, this organization called Rise Against Hunger ships these all around the world, and right now they're going to Nicaragua and the Philippines. And then we are going to have to do, how many boxes did we say? 70. 70 boxes, right. So this is where you come in. We need helping hands because Carl and I, well, we are quite good, <laughs> are not that good. No. So um, we are looking for about 80 volunteers to help with that. Um, it's a fun event, uh, a fun time, and uh, we'll do that together. So you can sign up this morning to help. There's a QR code in the center of your bulletin. There's also a QR code or a place outside uh, in the narthex to sign up or you can just talk to uh talk to carl or i will help you and and you don't have to be a member of the church to do that nope. if you, this is your first sunday with us and you'd like to come participate we want to invite you to do that it's right. a it is a wonderful wonderful event and you get to wear a hairnet so just, oh, it's just so to put that out there it's so fast careful with flowers so we'll do that um, in two weeks. This is also a great way to showcase what St. Andrews is all about. So if you are somebody who comes regularly and you would like to invite somebody to a church event, this is the perfect one. So um, we were, we're about, what did I tell you earlier, halfway there um, with, with our volunteers. We could, so we could use more. So there's still spots. And I should mention, there's no age limit on either end. So if you've got a three-year-old, they can probably help. And if you've got a 96-year-old, they can definitely help too. We've got stations for people who can walk easily, and we've got stations for people who can't walk easily. So we got that covered. And now we're going to continue in worship. Would you stand and join us with our next song? Alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Oh, happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day. Day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. When I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. 
endless joy and perfect peace. Earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Dancy. All right. You may be seated. Um, we're going to take a moment to be uh, in prayer, uh, and then uh, we will close with the Lord's Prayer. But um, let's just take a moment to be in God's presence and to uh, remember on this day. Loving and gracious God, on this Easter morning, uh, even as the clouds were rolled in here, we, we know that your light is shining, and we welcome you. We welcome Jesus into our lives. We welcome that your resurrection is for us, and that it is life-changing and life-giving and life-sustaining. We welcome the hope that it brings to our world. We welcome the light that it brings into the darkness and that the darkness cannot overcome it. Lord, may your resurrection give life to those who feel lifeless, to those of us when we sometimes feel like we're just going through the motions, to those of us who have lost, to those of us who, who are in need of your hope, because that's what this message is about. It is about hope that your kingdom way of living, that the way of love that Jesus taught for you and for neighbor, the way of love that makes boundaries fall down and drops walls, that's what you have called us to follow. That is the new life that we experience on Easter as we seek to follow your son in his sharing of your love that is for everyone. May we feel your joy on this Easter morning. And as we come before you now, hear us as we pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the 11 and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them, but Peter, got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scriptures. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, offer a, a special word of thanks to um, to our musicians, to our our band, our choir, our guest musicians, our accompanist Insuk, our director Jens. Can we give them all just a hand for putting this music together? Did I forget anyone this time? No, okay, I got it all. All right, good. Um, and then uh, thanks to uh, Karen, who is doing our um, uh, Sunday school downstairs. She, she's downstairs, so she can't hear us, but thanks to her. Thanks to Emily, where, uh, oh, I know Emily is getting ready for the Easter egg hunt that will be uh, going on out there. Um, to our ushers, to our coffee people, um, to uh, the Gray Matter Museum of Art that we share space with. They have provided a special um, floral arrangement down there, uh, and I believe uh, an Easter, is it a marsupial? What is a rabbit? A, a mammal. An Easter, it is down there, um, and some other treats, so we are happy to, to have that, but there's a great photo opportunity on the landing down there for you to take an, an Easter photo uh, as well. So just thanks to everybody who has made this happen. Oh, and to our tech crew up in the balcony uh, who are putting us... <laughs> Um, online. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a moment to be in prayer. God, we thank you for this good news, this story of Easter that we find in Luke's gospel. Uh, we know each gospel tells the story a little bit differently, and this morning as we hear Luke's telling, allow your Holy Spirit to work through these words to speak to us where you would have us hear your Easter good news for us today. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start by asking the classic Easter question, which is, who in this room likes to clean their garage? <laughs> right? I got, okay, yeah, you're my people back there. That's right. I, I will tell you that when we clean the garage in our house, um, that is one of the few times that uh, um, our marriage is in jeopardy, um, my wife and I, because we clean the garage and decide what stays and goes in a very different manner. Um, but regardless of how you approach it, there is one thing we all do probably the same when we clean the garage, and that is you go in and you start looking around at all of the stuff, and then you, you take that stuff and you put it out onto the driveway, right? It all goes out, and as you're going through, you say, oh, well, oh, that's where I put that. That has been missing for a while, and how did this get in there? And, and then you say, and honey, do you think this was living at one time? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, you know, so if, all those things that you discover, but then that moment happens when you are in the garage and it looks so nice and empty and you're like, oh, I'm excited, this is working well, and you turn around 
and there is this disaster mess behind you. It's about that time you think maybe it's lunchtime, maybe we'll go in and watch the game a little bit because it is overwhelming. You start to say, what have I gotten myself into, right? But you have to get there in order to clean the garage. You have to take all of that mess out and make that moment in order to move forward. And you have to sit with it, and you have to sort it, and you have to have those difficult conversations of, do we really need this anymore or not? All of those things. It's disorienting, but sometimes it is the only way to really move forward. Being disoriented out of sorts, out of our comfort zones, uncomfortable, ill at ease, diseased, all of those things, we don't like those disturbing, disorienting moments in life. We would much prefer that it is the status quo and things just go along smoothly. Dr. Jack Mesereau, who's a, a well-respected theorist in the, the field of adult learning, um, says this about adults and disorientation. He says, the first step toward adult learning often comes in the form of a disorienting dilemma. This dilemma provokes a period of critical reflection to help us make sense of the disturbance, and as a result of our examination of what is happening, then we grow. We grow. Think about it. Often, we deepen our understanding and we learn when things have been turned upside down. Now, it's not that we go seeking things to be turned upside down, but let's be honest, life has a habit of doing that all on its own. Every single one of us in this room has been going along smoothly and then had life say, well, I'm gonna throw you this curveball. We're gonna turn things upside down this way. But perhaps that disorientation means that we might have fertile ground to learn something. It, it might be an opportunity for us to come out transformed on the other side of that. All great stories, of course, have that inciting incident, they call it, where the, the hero has to go through something difficult so that they can be transformed and come out on the other side. Um, one of our, our church members this week, we were talking, they asked, uh, is it hard to write an Easter sermon? Like, is that hard? Because really, how hard can it be? Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, it's the good news, right? It's all, it should be, it's the same story every year. But it isn't. It's never easy because this story is disorienting. And this week I think I realized that it's supposed to be disorienting. It's not supposed to be. You know, we've got all of these bright colors. We've got great flowers. You're going to go out there and there's going to be beautiful colors and you all, you all look fantastic out there. But maybe the real Easter, and certainly the first Easter, was a bit more disorienting than we think a bit more unsettling, and a moment poised for growth. And what I will tell you is that I know it's especially true for Peter, as we hear in this story. Now, if, if you've been with us through Lent, you know we've been on a six-week journey with Simon Peter, and we've been looking at this flawed but faithful disciple. Um, now, if you've missed it, don't worry, because I'm going to take you through every single sermon from six weeks ago. So just, because so, Lent is about suffering, right? So, no. Um, I'll, I'll sum up. Uh, so, Peter is sort of the team captain of the disciples, right? He's, he's sort of the lead disciple. He's the one that kind of gets uh, to the front of things. And, um, but Simon Peter's life is filled with many ups and many downs. And the ups are really high, and the downs are really low for Peter. Uh, he was called by Jesus to follow him, so this rabbi comes along the shore to this fisherman and says, follow me. And in those days, in the first century, for a, a rabbi to come and call you out to follow, that actually was an honor. And so Peter and his friends, they drop their nets and they follow Jesus. They have no idea what they're signing up for, but they follow him. And Peter was eager. He was always willing to answer the questions that Jesus asked. 
And Jesus even nicknames him. Uh, Simon was his name. Peter is his nickname. Peter in Greek comes from the word for rock, Petros. And Jesus literally says, you are the rock, Peter. And upon you I will build my church. That eventually happens, but it's not without a rocky road to get there. And, and Peter has a lot of ups and downs on that journey. And he is well known for many things, but one of the things, particularly in this Holy Week, this Passion Week as we build up to Easter that he's most known for, is being at the Last Supper, and Jesus says, um, you know, one of you is gonna betray me. And Peter says, no, I would never betray you, Lord, never. They might. He actually, in one of the Gospels, says, they might betray you, but I won't. I won't do it. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, before the night's through, not once, not twice, but three times, you're going to say, you don't even know me. And of course, that ends up happening and coming to pass. Jesus is arrested. Peter denies him. And then when Jesus, his best friend, is sentenced to die and, and goes to the cross, Peter is nowhere to be found. He's in hiding, he is ashamed, he is just destroyed and uh, a seeming failure, probably one of the most disorienting moments in his entire life. And that is where we find him on Easter morning. We don't find him sitting there going, all right, I know the resurrection's coming, it's, this is gonna be it. No, Peter is devastated. Think about it, think back to Friday afternoon. Uh, where you were Friday afternoon. And, and from that time until now, you are just devastated because you let your best friend, your teacher, down. That's where Peter is. He thinks everything is lost. First off, because his Messiah, the one he thinks was the Messiah, was crucified. And in first century Judaism, a Messiah does not get crucified. So they're all thinking, well, we, we placed our bet on the wrong horse. This did not go the way it was supposed to go. His friends have scattered, and now he hears this story from some of the women who have come back from the tomb. Early in the morning on the third day, it was early dawn that the women, mind you, none of the men, but the women, went to the tomb. And they go with spices. And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that they were going not looking for a risen Lord, they were going, expecting there to be a body. And they, they think that he is dead. No one is looking or even thinking about resurrection. So they arrive and the stone is rolled away, and then they're startled, and then these, these men appear in dazzling, um, you know, bright light, and they say to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Don't you remember what Jesus told you, how he was going to have to be uh, betrayed and arrested and put to death, but on the third day would rise from the dead? And the women remember, and they go, and they go to tell the disciples. It's, it's interesting, in Luke's telling, in fact, I, just, I even heard it again uh, this morning as it was being read, um, uh, remember how he told you. Then they remembered his words, and verse 9, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and all the rest. In the other gospels, the, the angels or whoever meets them there says, you better go tell the disciples. But in this one, Luke reminds us the women are the disciples. They go to tell the good news. They're not sent or errand runners for the disciples. They are the first preachers of the good news. And when they get to the disciples, their response is, ugh, what are you talking about? Dead people do not rise. I mean, they had some expectation of a resurrection in those days, but it would be everybody, all, all of the, the, the Jewish people rising when the Messiah came in, those that had died. But, but they're like, dead people don't come back to life. But Luke shares a unique little detail that stuck out to me. This one little verse, verse 12. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. 
And maybe it's because we've been studying Peter that it jumped out at me this week. But the rest of the disciples, they don't believe. But Peter gets up, and I'm not sure he believes either, but he runs to the tomb. And I I think he's thinking this weekend can't get any worse, and now somebody has stolen the body. He's still not thinking resurrection, and he gets there, he looks in, and he sees the empty uh, tomb, but he doesn't know what to make of it. He's overwhelmed and disoriented again. I know it says amazed in here, but this is one of those where the word can get translated a lot of different ways, and it's probably better translated perplexed, wondering, going, I, I, this doesn't make sense. He doesn't see the tomb and go, oh, well, Jesus is risen. I better go look for Jesus. He is just overwhelmed and disoriented again. But remember, disorientation, this is fertile soil. These disruptive sequences give a place where Peter can grow and that where we can be transformed and changed. If we can make it past the shock and the disorder and we can stay connected, then we can learn something. If we're willing to let go of our old mindsets, then we can grow. Uh, There's a a quote um, I heard in a podcast this week from uh, somebody named Marshall McLuhan, and he put it this way. We don't know who discovered water but we know it wasn't the fish. And just think about that for a moment. I had to, it's okay. We don't know who discovered water, but we're pretty certain it isn't the person that was surrounded by water. The fish have no clue the water is there, right? Fish don't know that there is water until they are plucked from the water and realize, "Uh uh-oh, this is not good. I need to go back to where I was. They are disoriented. But maybe these disorienting moments give us that new perspective to learn something new. Maybe the first message of Easter is that being disoriented, out of sorts, isn't a bad thing. Which then leads me to the other part of the story that stood out. And that is uh, going back to uh, the women. When the the men say to them, these angels, these messengers, um, they say, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And Jesus had said those things to people before. He had said this was going to happen. But the scripture that then jumps out is this one. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. See, they had forgotten. They were disoriented, but then they remembered. And I think in that remembering, the resurrection becomes real. I think it it brought them out of that disorienting moment. Then they remembered. It's in that disorientation that they remember, oh, there is hope. Jesus said this is not the end. The disorientation isn't the end of the story. Now, they may not fully understand, but they remember who Jesus is, and it helps them to move forward. Don't panic. I'm going to tell you that I don't fully understand resurrection and Easter. I mean, I know what it is. I can explain things, but I don't always understand what this story is about. I sometimes get disoriented by it. I sometimes am like, where are we going with this? Stay with me a moment. We're going to going to jump to a walk with my dog this week. I was out walking the dog, same neighborhood I always walk him in, and and I noticed something I have noticed before. Um, I I noticed the power lines. Um, And sometimes we look up, other times we don't. But but then when I notice things, I take a closer look at them. And I notice, you know, it's not just power lines attached to a pole. There are all sorts of things on these. There is this thing in the middle. 
I have no idea what that does. They seem to be around sporadically in our neighborhood, but they're there. Uh, there's this thing, which I looked at closer. It seems to be where a loop of wire is wrapped around it and then goes back to where it came from, which to me says, why didn't they just cut the wire in the first place? I don't know why it's there. If we have any power line workers out there after service, if you can explain what this is about, let me know. Um, this thing that I do notice on a regular basis is uh, this is right above, um, it's about six or seven feet in the air. It's this dish, and it uh, looks like there's a cord there, but that's really just like um, the edge piece that's come off. But, but it's, it's clearly attached, attached to the pole, and there's nothing, nothing attached to it. To it. I have no, no idea what, what that, that is for. for. No, no idea. idea. But, but you know, know what I do know? know? As, as long, long as, as I stay connected, connected as, as long as, as I pay the power bill and, and, and do all those things, things power gets to our house around the corner from there. I, I, don't, I don't know how it works, works and it's, it's pretty, pretty disorienting as I look at all that, that but it somehow works. works. The message of Easter is that the living God can come into the middle of sorrow and distress and disorientation and can transform it. The message of Easter is that we don't have to understand Easter to experience its power. We can be uncomfortable with it. We can be disoriented by it. But we also can remember that Jesus said, in fact, in the close of Matthew's Gospel, remember I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And it's in the remembering that resurrection becomes real. I, you know, we've all come from different places this morning. Some of us are, are, are in a smooth place and others of us are in disoriented places. But wherever you are, remember that Jesus is with us always, even to the end of the age. And that is the hope of Easter. Amen. I'm going to invite our uh, band to come back up. And we're going to do something on a Sunday morning that I, I'm fairly certain, in fact, I am 100% certain, we have not done in three years on a Sunday morning. Um, and our ushers are coming to the back. And that is, we're actually going to do a, you know, a, an offering. Remember, we used to do those in churches where we pass the plate along. Don't worry. Don't worry, though. Um, uh, this offering is uh, for something special. This is 100% uh, going to uh, the Rise Against Hunger uh, thing that we are doing on the 23rd. Um, everything that you put in is going to go to feed families across the world. Um, and we think that's an important thing for us to do. Here at, at St. Andrews, we, we seek to connect and to grow and to serve, and it's one of the ways that we serve. So um, I'm going to invite our ushers to um, lead our offering, and our band is going to play an offertory uh, called Glorious Day. And um, let's simply be in a time of reflection.
Uh, and I forgot to say, if, if, um, oops, if you uh, uh, didn't have anything to put in but still wanted to give, you can use this QR code here uh, to give online, as well as to sign up. So let's, uh, let's be in prayer. God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for your generosity in our lives, and uh, we pray for the families who will be fed um, by these wonderful gifts. We ask this all in your name. Amen. I welcome you to stand as you're able and join us in our closing hymn this morning, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Well, thanks again to all of our musicians. To all of you, you sound really good. Give yourselves a hand for good singing this morning. So um, we are going to close our service. I'm going to offer a benediction in just a moment. And then we are going to uh, close our service with the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, now, this is a sing-along version. I see that our ushers handed out some music, but if you prefer to read music, there's, they're coming down with some right now. Uh, if not, the words are on the screen. They're pretty straightforward. I think that you will, uh, you will get them. Um, and uh, there is a tradition of standing during the Hallelujah Chorus because it's said that King George II was so moved by it that he stood, and if the king stands, everybody stands. We're going to invite you to stand as you are 
able, if, if standing through it is, is uh, too much, you may sit down. Don't, please don't uh, worry about that. And uh, we invite you to join with us as we uh, celebrate Easter. And with that, let me offer a benediction, then I'll run over there. So uh, as we close this time, May we remember that though we may be disoriented uh, in life, that God's hope cannot be stopped, that death has been swallowed in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Amen.
Amen and happy Easter.